Well, hi there, and welcome to the last Bible study on the book of Revelation on the Lighthouse Discord server. It has been a journey. And last week we talked about Revelation chapter 21, talked about heaven and what the walls are going to be made of and all the jewels and the gemstones and the beauty, the streets of gold, etc. So now we're on to chapter 22, but before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father, it is an honor and a blessing to be able to share your word and talk about your word across the miles, many miles in some cases. Father, we're in kind of a difficult time right now, and I know you know about it because many people are praying, but COVID has attacked some of our own, whether it be that people on this server have contracted the virus and have healed from it, whether it's someone close, like a family member or a roommate or a friend, but we've all in one fashion or another been impacted by this virus. Holy God, I ask in your name, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus, that you would bring healing and resolution to all the cases of which we know about, that you would comfort those families who have lost loved ones, and that especially you would touch those who are in ICUs, not only in Canada and the US, but across our land, across our globe. We are in desperate need of you. And as we look forward to the day that Jesus returns for us and we go to live in the new heaven and the new earth, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor as we look forward to this for the promise that you gave us through your servant, John. In your holy name we pray, dear Jesus, with thanksgiving and honor. Amen. So, Revelation 22, the river and the tree of life. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was a tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will be no longer, or sorry, there will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be, or there will no longer be any night. And they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the word of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets and of those who heed the words of this book, worship God. The final message. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong and the one who is filthy still be filthy and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. 
Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So that's the final book or the final chapter of our book. So the first five verses actually continue the theme of chapter 21 which is a comparison of the original creation with the new creation. But the final 16 verses have two main themes. The first is that the book of Revelation is a book of prophecy. And the second is that the second coming of Christ is imminent. imminent. So you see, paradise was lost by Adam and Eve, but paradise was regained by God. And some say most, if not all, Bible prophecy has been fulfilled, including the book of Revelation. Five times, God says the book of Revelation is a book of prophecy, not history. And I'm going to just list the verses. We have Revelation 1, 3, Revelation 22, 7, Revelation 22, 10, Revelation 18, and Revelation 19. So some ask, where is the promise of his coming? Six times Jesus says he's coming. Revelation 2 5. Revelation 2 13. Revelation 3 11. Revelation 22 7. Revelation 22 12. And Revelation 22 20. Now, I didn't stop that we would look at all of these, but you're welcome to listen later and pick them up and have a look at them. So verse 1 of Revelation 22, and I read from the New American Standard. Our commentary uses New King James, and that's what I'm following. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So you see here, John is actually still comparing. The original creation to the new creation. So he's either contra or contrasting the river that flowed in the Garden of Eden and under the walls of Babylon to the river that will flow from the throne of God. And that, by the way, is in New Jerusalem. Or he's contrasting the life-giving water that flowed through the famous hanging gardens to that which will flow from the throne. Now, slaves turn screws to lift water from the Euphrates River to be released at the top of terraces to flow down through the trees and flowers in the garden. And up to this point, the angel has been showing John the city's basic framework, the foundations, the walls, the gates, and a street. 
The holy city, however, will also contain other things such as water, trees, and fruit. And here we see that it will have a river called the river of water of life. In other verses of scripture, this water of life is called living water, and it's used as a symbol for the Holy Spirit. We could look at John 4, verses 13 to 14 for that. You see, God is using a physical substance, that is water, to help explain a spiritual truth. Living water flows pure, clear, and fresh. It's not murky, stagnant, or polluted. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been near standing water, but I have. And let me assure you, it is not a pleasant experience. But living water possesses life-giving qualities that man cannot live without. We can look at John 3, verses 1 to 8 for that. The river of the water of life is portrayed as a river that will possess life-giving powers, water that will restore and refresh, flow in abundance, and satisfy our thirst. Have any of you, and this is just a thought, ever been so thirsty that you just can't seem to fill that need? or satisfy your thirst. Now the source of this river will be the throne of God and of the Lamb, and they will supply life-giving water and the Holy Spirit in abundance to the holy city. John 7, verses 37 to 39 talks about that. Now the Trinity, that is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, will be present to me all our needs. Leon Morris wrote this. For the third time in this section, John adds, and of the Lamb to his reference to God. He will not let us miss the supreme significance of the Lamb in the final stage of things. And of course, the Lamb is Jesus. Revelation 21, 6. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Wow. Verse 2. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was a tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, those who entered ancient Babylon saw the beautiful hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world, and those who enter New Jerusalem will see something even more beautiful. Just picture for a moment. A street of pure gold like transparent glass. It will have mansions of gold on either side and a river of crystal clear water throwing, or flowing down the middle with rows of trees on each side. This is the magnific magnificent scene that John is trying to describe. You see, the tree of life takes us back to the Garden of Eden. We hear about that in Genesis 3, 22 to 24. Before they sinned, Adam and Eve could have eaten from it and lived forever. And in the new Jerusalem, rows of the tree of life will grow. The trees will produce a different kind of fruit every month, which will provide a continuous supply of food from God. This says something about the heavenly bodies. Just as Jesus ate and drank after being raised from the dead, believers will eat and drink in the holy city. And we could look at Luke 24, verses 30 to 43, about Jesus eating and drinking. So believers will diet on manna and fruit from the tree of life. They will not eat the leaves of the tree because the leaves will be for the healing of those who dwell on the new earth. And these leaves will sustain life and add to well-being. Now, Henry M. Morris wrote this. Most prominent of all is a mighty river of clear, sparkling water coursing down from the center and apex of the city. Although the text does not say so, 
we are probably justified in inferring that this river, like the river in Eden, which was its typological forerunner, parts into four heads, Genesis 2.10, which in turn descend from level to level, providing abundant water for every need, aesthetic as well as physiological of the residents of the city. So it's kind of like it starts at the top and it spreads to another level and another level and it just keeps on flowing. Now the tree of knowledge caused Adam and Eve to know right from wrong. It's how they learned what sin was and it caused their spiritual death, which was separation of their soul and spirit from God and their physical death, which was separation of their soul and spirit from the body. It costs them immortality. The tree of life does the opposite. Eating its fruit brings immortality. So, Revelation 2 7 To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2 17. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Interesting thought. All right. So verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, God placed a curse upon creation in Genesis 3, 14 to 19. Because of it, women experience pain in childbirth, both men and women, women suffer sickness. Both must today work for a living, and the physical and spiritual death came upon mankind. Sin has caused great harm in this present creation, but it will not affect the new creation. Once God has cast Satan with him, all his followers, or sorry, Satan with all his followers into hell, and raised us with new bodies to dwell in his constant presence, all of the curse will be gone. Now, please understand that the Antichrist and the false prophet, and then Satan will be cast into hell. But later, they're cast into the lake of fire, which is the eternal damnation, eternal torment and suffering. And that's where they stay. The holy city will be made the new location of God's throne. We will not be floating on clouds with harps in our hands, but instead we will be praising and serving our God. Now Robert H. Mounts wrote this. God has, through the redemption wrought by his son, set into motion a new humanity. In the present age, he rules the hearts of all who have turned to him in faith. In the age to come, that reign will find its full completion. Sin will be forever removed, and the design of Eden will be totally realized. So in the new Jerusalem, which is the new city, there will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain, according to Revelation 2.4. There will be no temple in Revelation 21.22 sun or moon in verse 23 night in revelation 21 25 there will be no more impure shameful or deceitful thoughts in revelation 21 27 and there will be no curse in revelation 22 3 revelation 5 10 says you have made us kings and priests to our god and we shall reign on the earth Revelation 22.4, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. You see, in the Old Testament, it was Moses who wanted to see the face of God. And in the New Testament, it was Philip. Now Moses, this talks about in Exodus 33.18-23 and Philip in John 14.8-9. and 9. However, as residents of the Holy City, we will actually see the face of our Father and His Son. 1 John 3, 2 talks about that. And the name of God will be written on believers' foreheads to identify them as God's own. 
Now, a, na a name stands for much or little, depending upon whose it is. You see, the name of the Antichrist on the foreheads of his followers will bring them everlasting torment. The name of God on the foreheads of his followers is the greatest name of all. It stands for his character, honor, glory, faithfulness, and much more. It means he is staking his reputation on that person. Revelation 3.12, I will write on him the name of my God. Then we're at Revelation 22.5. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. See here, this is the second time that we've been told that there will be no night in the holy city. Lamps, flashlights, light bulbs are not going to be needed. And we're not going to need the sun for heat or to grow our crops, because God and Jesus will light the entire creation. They will be all that is needed, and believers will have the honor and privilege of reigning with them forever. Randall Price wrote, The city qualifies in every sense as a physical reality, with measurable architectural structures, plan design, building materials, rivers, trees, and human inhabitants. What appears to be an incredible description is intended to accommodate our present inability to grasp such heavenly realities. An eternal city designated for an eternal people is not of earth. And as the handiwork of an infinite, infinite God, we should not expect it to conform to human convention. Interesting thought. From an earlier study, when we talked about the new city, it's not determined that the new city will actually sit on the ground. We don't know that for sure, but we know that it will be a magnificent place. Revelation 22, six. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the Holy Prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. This marks a turning point in this final chapter, because John now turns from the contrast of the old creation with the new creation to some closing promises and warnings. The angel reminded John of the truthfulness of these words. He is giving his assurance that this prophecy is trustworthy and will be fulfilled. See, the angel also reminded John of how this message was given. The Lord Jesus sent his angel to give the prophets spiritual understanding. Talked about in Colossians 1.9. In other words, Jesus is the source of this revelation. And because he is, it must be fulfilled. The things that must soon take place have already started. In fact, the first part of this prophecy, Revelation, the church age, is almost over. Everything from the rapture to the second coming is near at hand. So what our commentator and the experts say who prepared this commentary is that basically we are at the end of Revelation chapter 3, which is the church of Laodicea. So if you are thinking that we're partly into the end times, or at least into the tribulation, we're not quite there, at least not according to these experts. And I tend to believe that because I think there's an awful lot that is going to need to happen before the tribulation comes, like the revelation of the false prophet and the Antichrist. False prophet being the one who's in charge of this one world church, or one world religion. The Antichrist being in charge of the new world order, or one world government, currency, etc., which, according to our previous studies, 
is supposed to, both of these, will be centered on, if the commentators are correct in interpreting this, a rebuilt city of Babylon, which is why it's called the Whore of Babylon, or as our commentator used, and as my version of scripture used, the harlot of Babylon. And that was to refer to the false church, the false government, and the city of Babylon. Not a person, just to clarify. So, Revelation 3.14 says, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness. J. Vernon McGee wrote this, These words are faithful and true means that no man is to trifle with them, by spiritualizing them or reducing them to meaningless symbols. Our Lord is talking about reality. Verse seven, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now behold, I am coming quickly can be interpreted in at least two ways, soon or shortly or suddenly. Soon or shortly means before long. Subtly means very fast. And this is significant because people get the wrong impression when we say Jesus will come very soon. What we should say is when he comes, it will happen very fast in the blink of an eye. Now, many people wonder why prophecy is so important. Well, it's important or its importance does not lie in predicting the future, but rather in the changing of our lives by giving us a desire and concern for the lost and the unsaved. Unsaved, of course, is unbelievers, those who have not accepted Jesus as their savior, those who are not born again. And the fact is that God means for prophecy to be obeyed, and those who do obey are promised a blessing. Revelation 1.3, blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Revelation 22, eight. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Now see here, John is repeating his claim that he is the human author of Revelation and that he both saw and heard the things he writes about. He was so impressed with the angel that revealed these things to him that he was overcome with awe and fell down to worship at the angel's feet. Verse 9, then he said to me, <coughs> excuse me, see that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Now, this is the second time that an angel told John not to worship him. Angels are servants of God, the same as John, and the prophets are servants of God. And it's a mistake to worship angels. Only God is worthy of worship. Revelation 19.10, And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. Verse 16. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Now, when Daniel wrote his prophecy several hundred years before the birth of Christ, he did not understand some of the things that God had shown him. He wanted an explanation, but the fulfillment of the prophecies was a long time off. So he was told to seal them up until the end time. That happened in Daniel 12, 4. Revelation is different, though, because John's prophecy was already unfolding and the church age was taking hold. For this reason, the message was to be left unsealed. And God wants people to hear these things now. Now, you'd have to go way back to the beginning of our Revelation studies. But I remember a number of experts that were asked about the various ages within the church or the various 
church times. And if I recall correctly, the church of Laodicea, the age that we're in right now, started about year 1900. So we're now 120 years, almost 121 years into this. Interesting thought. Verse 10. Sorry, I lied. Verse 11. He was unjust, let him be unjust still. He was filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Now the time is going to come when a person's final destiny will be determined and sealed forever. And when the eternal day dawns, all unbelievers will be condemned and cast into that lake of fire that I mentioned earlier. And they're going to be without hope because their eternal condition will never change. But on the other hand, all believers will be accepted and given entrance to the holy city where they will continue to grow and improve. Hope and holiness will always be there. Quite honestly, this is a warning regarding the separation of the lost and the saved. A great gulf will separate the lake of fire from the holy city that no one can cross. Luke 16, 26. The decisions people make in this life will determine their destiny and seal it forever. Robert H. Mounts wrote, The arrival of the end forecloses any possibility of alteration. Verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. Well, the question lies, heaven or hell? See, this is a repeat of Christ's personal promise that he will return, and when he does, he will bring rewards with him. He will separate the lost from the saved, and everyone will receive rewards according to the quality of work they've done. In 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15, not much is said in church about rewards. For the most part, it's a neglected message. No one deserves rewards, but we know they will be given because this verse tells us, if we would let the goodness of God sink in, most of us would do more to honor him and follow the advice of the apostle John in 2 John 8, where he says, Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Verse 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So Jesus is using three of his titles to identify himself with the Father. He has used them several times before. And no one else can use them because they assert his deity. Explain it? No one can. We must take it by faith. Verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So Christ's words here imply a choice between washing our robes or leaving them dirty. Those who choose to wash their robes and therefore accept Christ will be blessed with two rewards, access to the tree of life and permission to pass through the gates of the holy city. Those who leave their robes dirty by refusing to accept Christ will be rejecting his rewards. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is one of the most popular and best known teachings of Jesus. And it begins with several principles that Christians very often call the Beatitudes or proclamations of blessing. And Revelation also contains some Beatitudes, but very few people are actually aware of it. So Revelation 1, 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written it. Revelation 14, 13. 
Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Revelation 16, 15. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Revelation 19, 9. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who is part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 22, 7. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are those who do his commands that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Uh, but here comes verse 15. But outsider dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Jesus is providing his own list of those who will not be blessed with access to the tree of life and the holy city. Instead of fruit from the tree of life, the dogs, that is, those involved in the occult, sexual immorality, idolatry, and lying, will eat the garbage of hell. Instead of access to the holy city, these dogs will scavenge in the lake of fire. Revelation 21.8 but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. This is serious business, friends. And it should put in our hearts the desire to share the gospel message with everyone we come into contact with. Because if not, if they don't accept and receive Christ as Lord and Savior, that is their destiny. I can't emphasize that enough. I have had people in recent days, and I'm talking days, not weeks, months, but days, who bring profile pictures that are absolutely lewd, for example, or evil, calling themselves names that are absolutely from the pit of hell. And when they've been asked to change them in a very kind way, they've declined and left the server. That's their choice. But we need to understand, friends, that it's critically important that we repent of our sins and make ourselves as right as we can before God and let him make us right in him. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So here Jesus reiterates the first two verses of chapter 1 by saying that revelation is a testimony he gave to an angel for delivery to the churches. The root and the offspring of David, David coming from Jeremiah 33, 15, comes from the Old Testament and is a reference to the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. The bright and morning star, you can see that in Numbers 24, 17 and Revelation 2, 28, comes from both the Old and New Testaments. Jesus is identifying himself as the one who will appear near the end of earth's darkest hour, which is the tribulation period. And he alone will bring a brighter day to the world, which is the millennium. Now, Henry M. Morris wrote, the claim is actually that of being the God slash man. There is no other way that one could be both an ancestor and descendant of the same person. So there's actually seven I am's in Revelation. Revelation 1 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. 
Revelation 1.11. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Revelation 1.17. I am the first and the last. Revelation 1.18. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation 21.6. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Revelation 22.13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Then Revelation 22.16. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who, who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Friends, for anyone who's an adult and, you know, ever been to a pub, even if you don't drink, just to listen to music with friends or whatever, you might he have heard if you've ever closed the place down, and I have in my distant past, um, you'd hear a bartender say, final call. Well, God, this is God's final call. It's a call for all believers to come and a call for all believers to tell all unbelievers to come. The Holy Spirit works in and through the bride of Christ, that is the church, using them or using us to invite all believers to come to Jesus and drink of his salvation, the water of life. Let him who thirsts come. Those who are tired of living without Jesus should come. God invites all who desire to receive his free gift of salvation through his son, Jesus, to come. Now see, our intent on, on the lighthouse is not to debate with people. What our intent is, is to invite all who desire to receive his free gift of salvation through Jesus, to come, all of us. Verse 18, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Friends, revelation was given by God and it is his word alone. He alone has authority over it. Anyone who adds anything new to the words of the book of Revelation will feel the wrath of God upon him. Now, there are religious groups today that teach that God is love, but refute the message of salvation, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the tribulation period, and hell. Now, wouldn't you call this adding and taking away from the word of God? Here's a few examples. Jehovah Witnesses teach that Jesus is really the Archangel Michael and that hell is really the grave. Mormons teach God rather than Jesus was once a mortal human being and that worthy humans are going to become gods and goddesses. No. New Age teaches that God is a cosmic force, not a personal being. And the Moonies, which most of you might not have heard about, but I did when I was young, is that Eve's sin was a sexual affair with Satan. And no, I'm sorry, but all of those are lies. They're heresies. So if God struck down Ananias and Sapphira, or Sapphira in Acts 5, 1 to 11, for introducing sin into the early church, what do you think he will do with those who do it today? Verse 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So taking away from this book brings on a second part to God's warning. Anyone who deletes anything from this book risks having his or her share in the tree of life and the holy city erased. Those who do delete something prove not only that they do not love God or believe in his word, but that they're destined for the lake of fire as well. 
It's tough. But it's a book of prophecy, not of history. Revelation 1.3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Revelation 22.7, blessed is he who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 22.10, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 22.18, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And then Revelation 22, 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. serious stuff friends verse 20 he who testifies to these things says surely i am coming quickly amen even so come lord jesus so the phrase i am coming quickly is his final response in answer to this promise of the lord's return john responds amen even so come lord jesus this is a statement of John's personal belief, and he urges Jesus to come back. And then our last verse is 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. These last words of the Bible will serve as a reminder that grace makes salvation possible. Have a look at Ephesians 2.8. Grace will keep us out of the lake of fire and let us pass through the gates of the holy city. I've heard this before, that grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Revelation 1.4, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So what are some facts about salvation? We've got four. Romans 3.23, everyone needs it. John 3.16, everyone can have it. John 14.6, only Jesus can give it. And John 3.36, only believers receive it. God... As we have now finished the book of Revelation, and we understand a little bit better about what we look forward to in spending eternity with you, I ask, Father, that if there is anyone here in this study who is not certain that they have a personal relationship with Jesus, or if there's anyone who listens to this study later and is in any way uncertain, then I pray, Father, that they will pray this prayer along with me today. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe that you did this, that you bore my sin, that you died that you rose again three days later and that you will come back for me. I give you my sin. I repent of it. And I ask you to change my life. Come into my heart, Jesus and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In your name I pray, amen. Father, I ask that if anyone has prayed this prayer, that they will speak to us on the server or will DM me or speak to family or their church or whoever, 
but to share with someone else that they have received you as Lord and Savior. We give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you all the glory and honor that we can muster up because you have given us eternal life. And we have hope and a future of eternity with you. We thank you. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.